Ryan will talk to us. Thank you. Reading from Mark chapter 8, starting at verse 11. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. Then he left them, got back into the boat and crossed to the other side. The disciples had forgotten to bring bread, except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, It is because we have no bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I break the five loaves for the 5,000, how, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I break the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? So far our reading. Good morning, Olveston Reformed Church. My name is Ryan Niebuhr and I have the privilege of trying to unpack just a little tiny part of today's Bible passage. It's not working. Sorry, this is always the case in our church too. <laughs> Whoa, that's high. Cool. Thank you. Can you hear me better? That's good. All right, so yes, my name's Ryan and I have the privilege of unpacking today just a little bit of today's passage. So for those of you who don't know me, I am a member and an elder at Pathway to Life Church in Devonport. And for the past oh, 15, 16 months, I've been doing some part-time work uh, and training there. I guess you could call me our pastor's apprentice. Uh, so our pastor is, as some of you would know, is uh, Etienne de Wilson. So during this time, I've been able to preach and prepare a number of sermons and um, have nearly, nearly finished my cert for in theology. Uh, this has been a big change for me, as uh, in my previous life, I was working as a diesel mechanic. So I was working on large earth moving and mining equipment. So it's been a little bit of a shift for me to do this sort of thing, but God is good and faithful. And he has grown me so much in this time, and I found this time stimulating and challenging. So what else might you want to know? Uh, I'm married to Bianca uh, and have been for nine years. Uh, we have a sort of adopted daughter. That's a long story, I can tell you later if you like. I enjoy fishing, I enjoy camping, just all the outdoor stuff really. So if you want to know more, come and find me afterwards, I'd be happy to chat about any of it. So let's launch into today's passage. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. What does Jesus mean when he says to watch out for the yeast. It's a, as uh, Jeff showed, it's a very small, it's a microorganism that ferments and causes the bread to rise. Would you come with me as we dig a little deeper into this this morning? So there are two people groups, as Jeff already said, represented in this account, the Pharisees and Herod and the disciples. Let's take a look at both of them now in a little more detail. But before we do, would you allow me to pray? God, may your words be heard here this morning, not my own. Help us to be open and receptive to what you say through your word, the Bible, this morning. Convict us, encourage us, and grow us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's kick it off by looking at the first little part of the passage. Verse 11 says, The Pharisees came to be and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. Now, when I first read this passage, I wondered if these guys were present with Jesus just before, because just literally just before, he'd fed 4,000 people with a handful of bread and some fish. If, if they had been there, why on earth would they need more signs 
that he was indeed the Messiah. Well, the truth is the Pharisees were not at their feeding of the 4,000. They had not seen Jesus perform that miracle. And they would never, ever have lowered themselves to, to that standard as it was a Gentile area that the feeding occurred in. So the Pharisees were not part of this miracle that Jesus had just done, feeding the 4,000. Okay, well then if they didn't witness the miracle of Jesus feeding the 4,000, then maybe like me, then you think, oh, well, perhaps they just honestly uh, wanted to set the record straight. Perhaps the rumours in flying around and the Pharisees had not yet seen this Jesus guy uh, who they'd heard so much about. And when they finally, finally got to meet him, like most of us would, they ran up to him excitedly and asked him to show them a sign. So like the ones that they'd heard of happening but never seen for themselves. Well, this is not the case. They had seen Jesus do plenty of miracles. In fact, it says earlier on in the book of Mark, actually in chapter 3, that in response to Jesus' uh, miracles and teaching, the Pharisees actually accused Jesus of being demon-possessed. So these guys had seen miracles and they'd heard about Jesus' teaching. They had more than enough proof to know that Jesus was indeed the prophesied Messiah. The Pharisees were well-educated on what we now know as the Old Testament. That was their job. They studied it and they were super, super religious. They knew that a promised Messiah was coming. They did not want it to be Jesus. He was too revolutionary and was likely going to upset their way of life, their nice, comfortable, religious life. Now, something else to note uh, is that the NIV just doesn't quite capture the motive or emotion that the Pharisees came to Jesus with. Now, English words are often left lacking a little when it comes to clearly defining the Greek descriptions given in the original text. So verse 11 says, the Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. Sounds civil and respectful enough, right? Now, one commentary I read said this about verse 11. Several Greek words in verse 11 are more antagonistic than the NIV indicates, leaving no doubt of the Pharisees' opposition. So the Pharisees came to Jesus. That sounds harmless, right? Wrong. The Greek word used for came is connected to military rank. They came against Jesus as soldiers to an enemy. Another word the NIV uses is question. Now, while the use of this word is not incorrect, it doesn't mean they politely raise their hand like a good little schoolboy and um, ask the question. There's a sense of opposition in there. They were disputing and opposing Jesus in the way that they questioned him. It wasn't at all polite or respectful. And even the word used for test is more a test of destruction than a test of validation. Testing to validate an idea is very different than testing something to destruction. Testing how much horsepower an engine has is different than seeing how long it will run without oil. The Pharisees were testing Jesus to try to break him and his teaching. So checking out different Bible translations can be a little helpful here. The NLT actually gives us just a little bit more detail on this verse. It says they came to argue with him, testing him. They demanded a miraculous sign. So what does all this mean? The Pharisees were openly and hard-hearted in their unbelief. Our immediate reaction, or my immediate reaction to the text, did not necessarily make me think that. But when you just dig a little bit deeper, like we've just done, I think the hard hearts of the Pharisees becomes pretty obvious. Now, I'd like to attempt to bring this situation a little, little closer to home. To do that, I'd like you to turn your imaginations on. So we've all met someone who wants to make a point, right? The conversations can go something like this. What car manufacturer do you think is the best? Hmm, that's a tricky one. I think that, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. It's definitely Toyota. Whatever brand you just said or were about to say, you are wrong. It cannot compare with the Toyota. What car is more unbreakable than an old 2.8 diesel Hilux? Name another car like the old leaf-sprung diesel Hilux is comfortable, it's quiet, powerful and not overpriced. Uh, I can think of a few actually. No, you can't. No, no, you can't. <laughs> and on and on it goes. I'm guessing we've encountered people 
who asks a question only to prove their point, not because they want to know the answer, but to bash you and your ideas and prove that what they know is the best. This was the Pharisees in this moment. The Pharisees did not want to know who Jesus was. They had made the decision. They chose to believe that Jesus was not the Messiah, not God's son. No matter what Jesus did, they were never going to change their minds. Jesus knew this, which is why he didn't do as they asked. You know, it would be a waste of time to try and convince me that Hiluxes were actually not the best vehicle ever made. My attitude was one of arrogance and I was not willing to listen to other ideas. My preconceived bias and ideas were simply just in the way. The Pharisees were the same. So, are you openly hard-hearted? Am I openly hard-hearted? Do I, do you, have preconceived ideas of who God should be? Do you really want to know the answers to the questions that you ask about God? Do you really want to know who God is? Think deeply and honestly about these questions. They are important. So let's go back to this little microorganism that makes bread rise, the yeast. The yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod, Jesus refers to, is unbelief. Both the Pharisees and Herod shared one thing in common. They were united in their view of Jesus. Both Herod and the Pharisees uh, have a strong unbelief in who Jesus is. Surely, Jesus' own disciples would not struggle with unbelief. Why would Jesus warn them so clearly against it? These guys literally lived alongside Jesus. They were there when he performed the miracles. They were there when he taught the people with power and authority. How could they possibly have been at risk of unbelief? So let's shift our focus now to this bizarre interaction between Jesus and his disciples in the boat. So having just, just dealt with the openly hard-hearted, unbelieving Pharisees, Jesus makes this statement to his disciples. Watch out for the yeast, that's also known as unbelief. Watch out for the unbelief of the Pharisees and that of Herod. How do the disciples respond? They bicker amongst themselves about forgetting lunch. Why? Because Jesus is thinking about spiritual things and the disciples are thinking about their stomachs. That's unlike men, isn't it? So the, the disciples have been around Jesus a while now. They've been exposed to his teaching. They've seen countless miracles. And yet, somehow, they still miss Jesus' point. Why would they be at risk of being infected by the yeast of the Pharisees? We have confirmed what this yeast is, right? Unbelief. Who has their Bible open still? What literally just happened before Jesus' encounter with the Pharisees? We've talked about it already. Jesus did an incredible thing. He fed 4,000 men. And this isn't counting the women and the children, so I had a guess we could pretty safely double that. So 8,000 people were just fed off a handful of bread and some fish. They even ended up having heaps left over. Yet somehow the disciples, now in the boat, are worried Jesus is unable to meet their needs. It doesn't make sense. Jesus responds to the disciples with a bunch of questions. These questions are found in verse 17 to 21, and it says... Jesus says this, aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? And ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? I can just imagine the disciples going, 12... And when I spoke to the, broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Seven. And he said to them, do you still not understand? Ouch. These questions are hard hitting, right? So what didn't they understand? What have the disciples missed? There is a case against the disciples here in that they became too familiar with Jesus. The teaching and miracles of Jesus should have continually blown the disciples' socks off. However, it would seem they have become complacent. Encountering miracles regularly and profound teaching, I'm sure, daily, it seems that these guys have grown too comfortable and used to it all. So that's subtle, cold-hearted unbelief. 
It's very different to the Pharisees' openly hard-hearted unbelief, but it's unbelief all the same. The disciples' intense love and joy of being with Jesus has been allowed to grow cold. Jesus teaching the masses, feeding the thousands of people, healing the sick, and teaching about the forgiveness of sins should cause a change in the disciples' lives. It would seem that it hasn't, at least not yet, anyway. So the disciples were closer to Jesus than anyone. They were with him physically. They saw many times with their own eyes how Jesus could do incredible things, yet they still didn't get it. The disciples saw Jesus' miracles and heard his teaching. The unbelief is due to a lack of application. Jesus just doesn't seem to have penetrated the disciples' hearts. Jesus did and said radical stuff, and his disciples just don't seem to have done anything with it except go, oh, that's cool. Jesus' teaching needs to have a response. We can be like this as well. Coming together each Sunday, as well as Bible studies, small groups, mentoring relationships, the podcasts we listen to, our personal devotion times, just to name a few, we have no end to encountering profound biblical truths. Are we too familiar with these? Do we simply hear a sermon, a worship song or a prayer and move on and change nothing in our lives as a result? I know I've certainly found myself doing this. So the disciples were physically with Jesus just about every day for about three years. They saw many miracles, they heard his voice, they smelt his breath, they felt his emotions, they did life physically with him. Yet somehow they became complacent. Now, we have never physically seen Jesus stand before us and perform a miracle before our very eyes. We've never smelled his breath, never heard his voice or experienced Jesus' emotions in the flesh like his disciples did. In a lot of ways, that makes it even easier for us to become complacent or allow the yeast to creep into our hearts. As we have less personal or physical experiences to go on than the disciples did. What will be different in your life after you leave here this morning? Honestly, ask yourself, what has changed in you spiritually since, your last, since last Sunday or the last small group or your last prayer meeting? Now, I don't want to make us feel guilty about this, but these are important questions to ask. Has subtle, cold-hearted unbelief begun to creep into your life? Maybe you've recognised yourself as openly hard-hearted or perhaps the subtle cold-hearted unbelief is creeping in. What do we do now? We need to get on track to becoming whole-hearted believers. Peter worked this out just a few verses later in Mark chapter 8. Actually, uh, in verse 27 to 30, it gives an account of a conversation that Jesus has with his disciples. Jesus asks them, Who do the people say that I am? The disciples reel off a few answers. Some think he's John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others reckon he's just another prophet. Jesus then goes on to ask his disciples this question. Who do you say I am? This is where Peter pipes up this time. And he says, you are the Messiah. Now this story is also recorded in Matthew 16. And it is the first time that the disciples acknowledge who Jesus actually is. So their unbelief is changing to belief. Jesus is becoming more than some guy who does cool miracles and has some strong debates with the religious leaders of the time, who are the Pharisees, who, by the way, no one likes very much. So this is the first of a few turning points for the disciples. Peter appears to be transitioning from subtle, cold-hearted unbelief to a more wholehearted belief in Jesus. Now, for those of you who know the New Testament well, you'll be thinking... Hang on, Peter failed a number of times at being a wholehearted believer. In fact, just after this account, Peter is told off by Jesus and accused of being Satan. Peter also ditched Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and denied who he was three times. Now, like I said, this is one of a few turning points for the disciples. However, eventually, Peter was the guy who really got Christianity going. You can read about that in Acts chapter 2. So my point being, we can begin to make this shift from unbelief, whether openly hard-hearted or cold-hearted, to a more wholehearted belief. We, like Peter, won't get it right all the time. We won't just flick a switch and all of a sudden become robots who follow Jesus at every turn. 
It is something that needs continual work and honestly will continually stuff it up. That's where grace comes in. God doesn't want perfectly coded robots to follow him. He wants a relationship with us. He knows that we mess things up and that's why Jesus died on the cross. We are forgiven for everything. Do you see yourself as openly hard-hearted like the Pharisees were? Let's have a quick look back at what it says in verse 12. After the hard-hearted Pharisees have confronted Jesus, it says, he, so Jesus, sighed deeply in his heart. So one commentary I read says, it's not an expression of anger or indignation, but rather a sigh of dismay or despair. Jesus wasn't angry at them, just saddened by the poor response given to him. I can imagine Jesus thinking to himself, why can't you just get it? All this religious rubbish, all this self-seeking, short-sighted life style, life is so much more than that. Should you just see who I am? Do you really want to know the answer to the question, is Jesus the Messiah? Or do you want to just make a point for why he is not? Maybe you recognise your heart has grown subtly cold. Perhaps like the disciples, familiarity has crept in or lack of application. Biblical truths can go in one ear and out the other without doing anything in our lives. That's a problem. A lack of application will lead to subtle, cold-hearted unbelief. Ask yourself, is what you heard and experienced this morning going to drift away into nothingness as you wander out the door of this church this morning? God wants us his children, to draw near to him. He wants a relationship with you. Just like a good parent longs for their child to love them and be in relationship with them, so does God. And also like a good parent, God will help you if you want him to. God has given us so, so much. He has given himself as a Holy Spirit to help us. He has given us his word, the Bible, to guide us. And he has given us his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. How is your heart? Is it hard? Is it cold? There is this incredible verse found in Ezekiel 36. It says this in verse 26. So Ezekiel 36 verse 26 says this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. God wants our whole heart. He deserves it. Will we give it to him? Let's pray. Lord, whatever our hearts are right now, maybe they're hardened against you. Perhaps we're all too familiar with you and you have lost some of your awesomeness in our lives. Would you give us new hearts? Help us to want to give you our hearts. Lord, thanks for your never-ending grace, mercy and love shown to us and may you draw us nearer to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.